Hi, Eddie. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. It's on meaningoflife.tv. At least this episode of it is also available uh, on uh, via audio podcast. You are Eddie Namius. Is that, is that the right pronunciation? Yeah, you got it. And I got Eddie right as well. So I'm two for two. So uh, you are a professor of philosophy and also head of the department, I think, at Georgia State University. That's right. Mm-hmm. Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Big pardon? In Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. In Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Um, and uh, you write a lot and talk a lot about free will. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, we hope to have settled the question by the end of the conversation. Because I think really far too much time over the millennia has been spent pondering this and we should let posterity get on to other matters i agree uh, so <clears throat> we'll see how we do one thing i want to talk about uh is this thing called compatibilism which i, I was kind of surprised to learn is apparently the majority view the most common view among philosophers these days it's the idea that actually there is no contradiction between free will and determinism um, uh, and, uh, that surprises me. I, I don't totally understand that, but maybe I will by the end of the conversation, cause you are a compatibilist. So you can, you can defend that, um, worldview. Uh, you know, first I wanted to say that one, one interesting thing about free will to me is that if, if you rely on introspective intuition, right, you just look at your deliberations you're inclined to believe in free will. It definitely feels like your deliberations are making a difference. Like I'm trying to decide between two things. I could do either. It's not determined until I make the decision. Neither is inevitable until I've made the decision. That's certainly what it feels like. Uh, And in fact, that helps energize the deliberations, our sense that they matter. And sometimes it makes them very uncomfortable, our sense that that there's high stakes and we're the ones deciding. It it can make it unpleasant. Um, On the other hand, if we rely on our intuitions about the external world, the world out there, you know, we think, well, you know, things out there, when something happens, it happens for a cause. And the thing that, hap- that caused it, in turn, happened for a cause. And it was the inevitable result of that cause. I mean, that tends to be the way we analyze kind of the world out there. And if you look at it that way, then you think, so everything's inevitable. Because when the cause- causal chain was first set in motion, that determined everything because one cause leads inevitably to the next and so on. So actually the future is inevitable, notwithstanding, and, 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 and maybe my introspective intuition is an illusion, the illusion that I have free will, right? So that's the, this is, and this is also, this is a traditional way of looking at the question, right? Either things are inevitable, that's determinism, or there's free will, our deliberations make a difference. That's the belief in free will. That's the traditional dichotomy that compatibilists say is a false dichotomy, right? That's right. So you you set it up really nicely. Uh, I think I think those two ways of viewing the world do appear to be irreconcilable: the the introspective and the view from the external or objective point of view. Um, especially if one thinks that the view from the objective point of view suggests inevitably, uh, inevitability or the inability to have an impact on the way the world goes. So I think the best way to start to overcome the intuition that those two things are at odds is to recognize that the way you framed it earlier in terms of deliberation is crucial for understanding that our deliberations are not uh, unimportant for the way the world unfolds. So one of the, one of the intuition or one of the intuitions I think drives the debate is something I call the bypassing intuition. And it's the intuition that our conscious deliberations, our imagining of future alternatives, our evaluating of our options plays no causal role in which of those options becomes actualized. And nothing about deterministic understanding of the world, or another word I want to bring in because I think it's more relevant for the way scientists think about this 
question of free will, naturalism or physicalism, mm -hmm. that ultimately everything is uh, is made up of physical things in accord with the physical laws, and that includes human beings and the human mind because it right. is our brain. Right. Um, and that, that could hold whether determinism or quantum indeterminism comes in. Right. And, and you've used the term neuronaturalism right. to describe this view as it applies to the brain. And I should add, by the way, that you're, you're, if people want to read what you've written about this, there was a book called Neuroexistentialism, an edited volume, and you have a paper in that on this subject. Uh, and in fact, I had a conversation with Greg Caruso, the co-editor of that volume, uh, uh, re uh, recently on this platform, and um, and also you wrote a piece in the New York Times, the Stone uh, right. blog there, where they do philosophy, and people can Google that as well. That's so, that's the short version, if they want the short version, right? The the, the user friendly version, so uh, or the layperson friendly version. So so anyway, go go ahead. So the the, the bypassing intuition is the the idea that if determinism is true, somehow the past forces us along to do what we're going to do in such a way that it really doesn't matter what our deliberations involve or how we, you know, how we think about our choices. Right. Our consciousness gets bypassed. Similarly, if you take a physicalist view, especially a reductionist view, it's easy to, to think that your brain forces you to do what you do and your mind, your conscious deliberations are somehow not playing the right causal role. Both of those intuitions are mistakes. And they're mistakes because neither determinism nor naturalism means that our conscious mind is not part of the universe, part of the part of the causal flow right. making a difference in what happens. Right. Now uh, at this point I'm tempted to go off on a tangent about what the relationship is between consciousness and the brain, but that would probably only <laughs> <laughs> that would probably lead to ruin, but I mean, it's just so relevant. I, I mean, for me to really understand what you mean by that, I almost have to ask you, what is your conception? Uh, you know, there there is this fact that it feels like something to be alive. We have subjective experience. It That doesn't seem to have been necessary. You can imagine complex animals that don't have that, um, right. and yet we do, um, but, but that raises, the, and there clearly is a close correlation between what we're feeling and thinking and what's going on in the brain that becomes clearer and clearer with these MRIs and so on. But, but the relationship of the two kind of the causal relationship of the two is an open question. Um, and well, and not only the causal relationship, but the relationship period. I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, because you have talked about consciousness being kind of bypassed by, um, physical things in the brain as if it's just yeah. kind of it's, it's, well my point there my, my my point there is precisely to avoid people having that intuition right reason, and the reason people have that intuition and in fact sometimes neuroscientists and other scientists have it more than i think ordinary people do and the reason is because we don't yet have a theory of how consciousness can be understood physically Right. I don't have that naturalistic theory. So I'm a naturalist. I presume you are. Mm -hmm. We think that there is a non-natural soul or mind floating nearby the brain, attached to it in some mysterious way. But we don't know how the physical processes of the brain explain the conscious experiences we have. And I really think ultimately the free will problem is going to boil down to the mind-body problem. Well, they certainly seem related. I, I mean, yeah. we should say just traditionally the kind of old fashioned dualist view associated with like Rene Descartes was uh, that, you know, the, 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 the mind, the soul, this whatever is, is this immaterial thing that can exert causal influence sure. on the physical machine right. and, thing, and things can work in the other direction. But but certainly, uh, and if you believe that, then then free will, you know, kind of makes obvious sense that there is this immaterial thing associated with consciousness that that has kind of autonomous, I guess, causal influence on the physical thing, and 
And so that's fine. But, but these days, almost no philosophers buy that kind of dualism. In, in other right. words, this interactionist dualism that moves in both directions, where the causality moves in both directions. So, so that's, for most philosophers, that's off the table, right? It is. But two, two points. I mean, first of all, that dualist view is precisely the one that the scientists who say free will is an illusion think everybody believes. Right. Well, they think everyone defending free will believes that. Including ordinary people. They think that's just the, they just think that's the definition of free will for most people. Right. Hence, they think science shows that that view of the mind is implausible. Science is showing we don't have free will. And part of my project is to try to show that that's actually not the way we have to understand free will. And it's not even the way most ordinary people think about it intuitively right so you've actually done experiments maybe you and, and and maybe other researchers as well but but interrogating people about their intuitions and i, I gather it turns out that y people even if you describe like a deterministic universe to them they say there would still be free will more or less yeah they they do although it's controversial and i have to say there's plenty of experimental philosophers who disagree with my interpretations of the results, including one of my collaborators, Thomas Nadelhofer. But to the extent that they show what I think they're showing, they suggest that ordinary people are what I call theory light about both free will and the mind-body relationship. Mm -hmm. Have this deep metaphysical dualist theory in place that would be challenged by the naturalistic worldview. Instead, they have the view that our conscious deliberations make a difference to what happens. And they don't know what our conscious deliberations are instantiated in. Mm -hmm. You tell them they're instantiated in the brain, as I have in some of my experiments, where we say, imagine in the future, we can use brain scanning devices to predict everything that people think and do even before they're quite right before they're aware of, of making a decision. I say, is that possible? And by far, most people, at least most college students at Georgia State, say, yeah, that's possible. Partially, they've grown up in this environment where we're told our brain does everything. Mm -hmm. And if I say, well, if this were actual, if this brain scanning technique existed, and our it was shown that our mind is our brain, and our decisions are made by brain processes, caused by brain processes, would we have free will? Most people say yes. And I interpret that to mean as long as they don't think our conscious deliberations are bypassed, it doesn't matter whether our conscious deliberations are instantiated or carried out by the brain or by a soul or by God knows what. Okay. You know, that, I, that I would makes, say, sorry. Does that make sense to kind of capture the way they're thinking about it? Yeah, and I would make a related observation, which is, you know, I mean, first of all, I think one people, one reason some people defending compatibilism, de defending the idea that uh, we can have free will even in a deterministic universe, one reason they think that's an important position is because they want to preserve the idea of moral responsibility that a lot of people associate with free will. People worry that if you tell people they don't have free, that free will doesn't exist, they will think you no longer need to hold people morally responsible um, for their actions. And one thing I, I've just kind of noticed, it, it, it's not the same as the, the experimental finding you just described, but, but in my experience, the intuition of moral responsibility, leave aside the intuition of free will per se, but the intuition that people who do bad things should be punished is so strong. I mean, I think it's like an evolved instinct. And it, and it is so strong that I'm not sure we have to worry so much about uh, about what happens, about how views of free will and determinism evolve generally. I'm, 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 I mean, evolve in the cultural evolution sense. Right. Um, yeah. but, but that's just kind of an aside. Um, well, actually, I don't think it's an aside. I think, you know, you and I, and most practicing philosophers and scientists, what, what we agree on is this naturalistic worldview. We agree that humans are evolved. We are ultimately, you know, made up of our brains and bodies. 
We can understand human behavior through psychology and neuroscience. We agree on all this. So one might wonder, and, and that and that includes all the people I call illusionists, like Sam Harris and Jerry Coyne. We should we should emphasize that's W I L L. Will illusionist yeah. meaning will is an illusion. Go ahead. Yeah. Who, who argue that science is showing free will is an illusion, and then philosophers like Greg Caruso, we kind of all agree about the metaphysics here. So then one might wonder, well, what are you disagreeing about? And I think what we're disagreeing about is several questions, one of which is how do ordinary people understand free will? And another is how, what would be the right and you know, morally best way to proceed under that naturalistic worldview? And for some people, the idea is, and, and you're probably one of these, it would be better if we gave up the idea that people are ultimately deserving of praise and blame and especially retributive punishment and then you have people on the compatibilist side who want to say, there's no reason to give up on all that wholesale. We still have the right sort of capacities to say that when someone does something bad of their own free will and our, def and our understanding of it, they still deserve to be blamed and to some extent punished. But we can get into... Uh, yeah, I mean, I should emphasize that uh, you're right, I don't believe in retributive punishment. Usually that doesn't make a difference for most purposes, because I do believe in punishment when it's of practical value. Right. So if you need to keep somebody in jail because they're likely to commit a crime again, or as a deterrent to others who might be inclined to commit right. the crime, then, then I'm, I, 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 I am in favor of it. But I do view it as a kind of regrettable necessity, because I don't think uh, it's ever morally good just in and of itself to punish people. The thought experiment that is the same one I discussed with Greg Caruso is you find a criminal on a desert island, they, they've committed some horrible crime, they've never been punished. No one back on the mainland is gonna find out whether you do punish them uh, and yeah. they're gonna stay on that island forever. There's gonna be no deterrent effect, nothing. They're never gonna harm a being again because they're gonna stay on the island should you punish them. If you believe in retributive punishment, you think, yes, you should inflict that suffering and some moral balance will have been restored or something. That's the part I don't believe. But and and since very few of us encounter people in desert islands, I mean, I will say retributive justice is enshrined in American jurisprudence. It is oh, yeah. judges are allowed to take it into account in, in sentencing. But as a, and it's enshrined in our psychology, for sure, very, very much deeply, as I said, I think instinctively. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much you consider this a tangent, but I mean, I'll say what I think about that scenario and others that involve, you know, a magic pill that you could give a wrongdoer to make them never misbehave again. Um, my own view is I don't think people should be made to suffer just for the sake of suffering. So if that's your definition of retributivism, I don't buy it either. However, I also don't buy the view that the the free will skeptics tend to take, which is that the only purpose of punishment is forward looking. I think the purpose of punishment is communicative. We punish in order to send certain messages. And one of those messages is you deserve to be punished because you did wrong rationally of your own free will. And what that communicative message might involve is something that is negative for the wrongdoer, negative in the sense of being told something they don't want to hear, being told they have to correct the situation in order to be reintegrated into society. These, by the way, are the evolved purposes of punishment, um, unless they are going to be banished because they're beyond redemption. But putting aside those cases, we want them to be reintegrated into society, but to do that, they have to hear the message and respond to it appropriately. Okay, but isn't that a forward-looking, pragmatic justification? It might be ultimately, but uh, to use to use the analogy that I think uh, you know Dan Dennett and Greg Caruso discussed this analogy in a, a recent discussion about this the the rules of the of of games you know we put them in place because ultimately they have forward looking benefits for the game itself and that's true of the rules of society ultimately we put them in place to help society function but once the rules are in place. 
whether or not to enact a penalty for violating the rules is backwards looking, not forward looking. And you don't, and, you know, it's based on whether the person deserves to be penalized or punished. And that depends on what they did, not on what that individual penalty will do for the game in the future. So it's both forward looking and backwards looking. Okay, well, I guess we'll leave that there. I mean, well, uh, except that I'll close by saying, well, so you're saying you find the person on the desert island and for the, because for the communicative, inherent communicative value of punishment, you go ahead and punish them. Not for the sake of the suffering inflicted, but right. you do it even though, it, in this case, it has no future value. But that's the problem. I mean, the setup, the setup with the desert island, the person isn't part of the community. So you've kind of taken them out of that, you've taken them out of the realm in which the communicative function of punishment is, is mm -hmm. considered, right? The whole point of the communicative theory of punishment is you do it in the context of the social, uh, trying to maintain the social order. Okay. This, it's a weird thought experiment. The, the magic pill is a better one. And with the magic pill, you know, unless you think people can take a pill and get the message that they need to hear as well, I don't think it works. I think you need to actually impose the punishment in the communicative form for the person to understand that what they've done is wrong, that they're responsible for it, and that they need to try to make up for it. They need to try to make up for it. Well, yeah. now, now uh, we're getting pretty into the weeds, but now, yeah. now, now that's about restorative justice. It sounds like if you want them to make up. That's for right. It, that's uh, right. It's gonna be a, that's going to be a crucial part of punishment. Well, yeah. Well, restorative justice is about the future, though. If you, if you, if you, if you do something for the person who was, who is the aggrieved. But I agree. Uh, uh, so, so we can, the forward looking, backward looking distinction is a mess. And it should be, and it should be avoided if at all possible. Punishment, just like blame and praise in our interpersonal lives can have both a forward looking and a backward looking purpose simultaneously. Uh -huh. Okay. So, but surely you agree as a good philosopher that in the course of a conversation, uh, any philosopher should be forced to uh, tell you what they would do in any given thought experiment, no matter how outlandish. Surely you've been frustrated by people who say, but that wouldn't happen, right? Of course. Okay, so I'm going to just ask you one more time. Would you punish the person on the desert island? And again, it will have no effect on the future. Right. I, I, if you force me to answer, I'd probably say yes, because the person should be communicated to in such a way that they can, that they can understand for themselves that they violated a moral norm and they should try to uh, try to become better in the future, even if they're not really interactive anymore. Even if it won't. Okay. But so it really is now, a thought experiment that it doesn't, it doesn't help illuminate the relevant intuitions in my view. Okay. So anyway, this, is the, this issue of uh, punishment is one reason and moral responsibility, uh, which people tend to associate with just punishment. Um, this is the reason that uh, some people think uh, compatibilism is a much needed view, a way to reconcile determinism and free will and, and thus uh, salvage the idea of moral responsibility. So I want to get back to the, to the idea yep. of compatibilism. Now, uh, and just to kind of be clear, when you talk about this idea that consciousness or conscious deliberation is bypassed, I guess you're talking about this idea that grows among other things out of these experiments that seem to show that the conscious, what feels like the conscious decision to do something is actually superfluous. The most famous one, the Libet experiment, they say, whenever you wanted to, you know, decide to push this button, decide. And the person's conception of when they're deciding seems to be after the physiological processes are set in motion, which lead to pushing the button. There are other experiments, but that, that is the kind of, and, and I know you have doubts about, uh, the relevance of these experiments to more the kind of more complex deliberations that matter for moral purposes. But leaving that aside, that is the kind of thing you mean by bypass? Right. So if some future neuroscience experiments that were even more developed than the original Libet ones showed that whenever we make a decision, 
the parts of our brain that are, because we're not being dualists now. So some part of our brain is going to be responsible for our consciously thinking, okay, this is why I'm making this decision. This is why I value this job over this job uh, or this person over this person to, to date. When I'm making this hard decision, these parts of my brain are going to be spinning. If the neuroscience showed that those parts of the brain are in fact not causally relevant to the decision I make and my, and my actions of picking one job over another or one person to date over the other, that would be bypassing. And I take, I take it that that would be really bad for free will. It would mean that what we associate ourselves with, that is our conscious thinking, our conscious desires and goals, that stuff is just a rationalization that happens after the fact. So that would be bad. Having said that, I don't think there's any evidence that that's the case. And in fact, it would be pretty crazy if it were true because it would mean that these, you know, significant activity in presumably largely frontal cortex and other areas of the brain that we engage in when we do really hard deliberations about important life decisions, that all of that neural activity is literally on it, it is not making a causal difference, that somehow we evolved such that all of that stuff is just a waste of the 2% of the energy our brain spends, 20% of the energy our brain spends. That would be crazy. Clear then in the bypass scenario, it's like my conscious deliberation is associated with these neurological processes, right? There are these like deliberation processes. But my, my sense that they are determining that what I'm going to do is wrong because the actual causal chain, neurological causal chain that's going to lead to the behavior is kind of in some sense bypassing that set of neurological activity. So that's the bypass scenario. Yeah, that's one of them. And, and that would be because they're either, you know, you can imagine they're Freudian unconscious brain processes or they're... Their sub, you know, subliminal advertising processes or their, the situational psychological, uh, experiments showing that, you know, we're, we're acting on forces that we're not even aware of. All of which would be threatening to the idea that we're making decisions consciously. Right. That would certainly be a threat. Okay. So then let's, let's move to, um, let's assume that the, the bypass isn't happening. I mean, I mean, I think there is, some evidence that uh, our, sometimes our conscious deliberations might be a kind of illusion. I agree completely in some cases. Yeah, but, but that aside, let's assume that the, the bypass isn't happening. So mm -hmm. the neurological chains associated with my deliberation are really involved in the causal chain that leads to the behavior. Now, a, an old-fashioned determinist, pre-compatibilist determinist, would yeah. still say, okay, but if that neurological causal chain is acting in accordance with the laws of science, then its outcome is inevitable. So your sense during the delusions, the things, the, during the, um, the, the deliberations that things might go either way was still a delusion because the outcome of the neurological process correlated with the deliberations was inevitable. Okay, so if we confine ourselves to that scenario, right. that's when the compatibilist argument becomes, I think, kind of important because, because, that, because now the compatibilism is required to salvage the notion of free will, right? Right, and, and, that's, and that's the old-fashioned determinism debate. That's right. right. Um, but it's, but it's just crucial to recognize that it's easy to mistake, uh, the, the old fashioned debate for this bypassing worry because it's easy to, to think, for instance, that once the, once the past happened the way it did, everything is inevitable. But if everything's inevitable, then what I decide has no influence on what happens. And that's not true. What you decide does have an influence on what happens. It's just that what you decide was itself a part of the causal chain. 
Okay, so yeah. that exactly. Now, so, so now we're back to the old problem. Right. Now, some of us find that markedly different than the, than the notion of free will. I mean, I mean, again, the, the traditional way of framing the problem was either what I'm going to do is inevitable or I can intervene and, and alter the outcome. And again, well, what compatible is saying is, well, it is all inevitable or let's pot, let's stipulate that it's all inevitable. But nonetheless, you can talk about yourself as having free will. That's the part I don't understand. Yeah, but Bob, even the way you're talking now slips in that bypassing notion because you keep using inevitable, right? I mean, inevitable suggests the word inevitable is, is very closely related to the idea of fatalism, the idea that certain things are going to happen no matter what. Right. No matter what I try to do, no matter what I want to do. But there's no way to think that determinism entails that unless you think we're bypassed, unless you think oh, see, we're not part of the cause. There's our disagreement. There's our disagreement. Again, I would say, okay, let's say there's no bypass. It's like yeah, it's there's, there's, there's this neurological activity associated with my, I'm going like, should I do A? Should I do B? Should I do A? Should, I'm weighing the options. You know, much like a computer program might, might, uh, consider different factors, yep. and and yet we'd say because the computer program uh, is is deterministic, you know, the, the the algorithm tells it how to weigh the factors and gives it a calculation that will determine which which path it chooses. Um, then, by the same token, if you are uh, have a scientific view of the way the brain works, presumably you think the outcome of the neurological processes associated with what feels like deliberation is, is inevitable, right? You, are you not accepting that part? I, I am. I, it's just the word inevitable is, is a tricky word. It's inevitable given those earlier. Well, of course, but the earlier yeah. things are given at that point. At that point, they are. That's right. Before but, they are, they are given before I started deliberating, right? Uh, they're given in the sense that you can't change the past, yes. But so, again, again, the way your conscious activity in a sort and, and it's it's a importantly different from the way we think computers work in the sense that uh at least as far as we know, the conscious deliberations involve sort of self representational activity that we don't think computers are able to do. If they do, then maybe they have the type of free will we're talking about. But putting that aside, it's inevitable if you understand that the past, holding fixed the past and the laws of nature, certain outcomes are going to occur. But which outcomes occur still depends on the way my deliberations proceed. So that if I deliberate such that I decide job A is better than job B for these reasons, my deliberating that way was the cause of my picking that job. Not only was it the cause, but it was a crucial cause. It was a cause such that if I had deliberated differently, I would have chosen differently. Sure, but I mean, at the risk of oversimplifying this, like if a train is going from position A to B to C to D, yep. and I say, you know, it couldn't have gotten to D if it hadn't traveled from B to C. I mean, let's say its momentum has been imparted at the beginning, so we don't need to right. have the option of cutting off the engine or anything. But anyway, yeah. you see where I'm headed. It's like you could say, man, that B to C part was critical. It wouldn't have gotten to D if it hadn't been for that B to C part. And I'd say, well, that's true. If you somehow magically pulled that out of the causal chain, of course, it wouldn't get there. But the fact is that once it left A with a certain velocity and momentum, getting to D was inevitable. You, if you want, you can focus on this B to C part and say, boy, that was critical. But the fact is everything that happened between B and C was inevitable and therefore D was inevitable. So if, you, you know, if you're taking the view that the Big Bang is the causal source of every train event for the rest of time, yeah. whether it's deterministic or indeterministic, and therefore everything is inevitable once the Big Bang has happened, 
then you're right. Everything that happens is inevitable. Everything that happens is inevitable. Well, not that, just that is mean. the deterministic worldview, right? And, and of course, That's there right. is this, this loophole from quantum physics about random yeah. things at the subatomic yeah. level, but I don't think either of us is know. imagining free will seeping in through the cracks, kind of. So, so, well, so, we, don't, so we don't imagine any external causal influences seeping in through the cracks. The key is to recognize that given that worldview, there still makes perfect sense to talk about some causal events being crucial in the way that events unfold in that. In well, that well sure. I mean, again, if they hadn't, or it's like if, if, you know, waterfall, it's like it goes to 100 feet above sea level, then 50 uh, to zero. Well, if it hadn't gone from examples, 100 feet, But all your examples are single track examples. Well, the, whole point, the whole point of what consciousness allows is it does allow for a conscious imagining of different ways that the future could go, that's not illusory, that, that imagining. Um, no, the weighing of the different, no. Yeah, and I'm not making a mistake when I think, if I thought, you know, if I thought this job was going to be better for these reasons, then I would pick this one, and if I thought these were better, I'd pick this one. Mm -hmm. The waterfall and the train don't do any of that. They really are ballistic. The difference between why we're free agents and trains aren't on the compatibilist picture, of course, is that what happens inside our heads is a uniquely important type of cause in the universe, one that involves uh, being able to make a, a goal such that we're going to try to achieve that goal across multiple paths, even if obstacles come in our way, one that allows us to change in light of deliberating about the past and maybe feeling regret for certain decisions. I'm just emphasizing these things so that we don't let your train metaphor make, well, you know, lead well, us to forget the importance of what kind of future. Sure, but, and, you know, I should emphasize, I don't actually have a position on this, on this yeah. in a certain sense. I'm a free will agnostic. That's good. Uh, you know, because, and, the, and one of the main reasons is because of the existence of consciousness, which has no satisfactory explanation. There's no satisfactory understanding of how, if, if right. it is, you know, neuro, neurological processes would give rise to it exactly. It, it's, to me, it's a complete mystery and that that leads me to to um to approach the question of free will uh with a certain caution but but well, it sounds said, like you think it sounds like you think it wouldn't be free will unless somehow consciousness played this you know well I, I, it's, role. E it's easier for me to, to to yeah yeah i guess i would say i'm old-fashioned in that sense if i well i'm not even sure i'd say that i mean free will is hard to imagine period like, okay. it, because even if you like imagine that like okay i have this conscious self that's autonomously causal it's as hard to imagine the interface of influence between it and your physical body as it is to go in the other direction and imagine how your physical body is giving rise to consciousness so so and of course there's a deeper question which is even if you had some separate thing a soul or whatever that the same questions arise again as Galen Strawson and others make clear. I mean, you gotta, you gotta wonder, well, why is your soul making the decisions it's making? What caused it to reason in the way it reasoned? So the, the exact same questions just arise, which is one reason some compatibilists are compatibilists because it's quite clear to us that indeterminism doesn't help. You can throw in the quantum physics. That doesn't help. Right. Dualism doesn't help. Because you still got the same questions about how did the soul get to make the decisions it made. So you're left ultimately with this dilemma. Can we make sense of free will or is free will something that's nonsensical? And if it's nonsensical, that's fine. I'm not sure how much we're committed to a nonsensical idea. I'm much more inclined to think that actually we're committed to a sensical idea it's hard to make sense of it in a deterministic, naturalistic worldview, but it's not impossible. And it's just as possible as it would be if you gave me a soul or any other magical, you know, non-physical parts of my brain or self. Okay. Well, I, I only emphasize that I'm actually agnostic on this. And, and 
And actually agnostic on the determinism course. I mean, you said, well, if I think that from the Big Bang, everything's been inevitable. It's not that I think that. It's just that I think that that's what determinism is. That's what strict determinism is. The, The compatibilist claim is that strict determinism is compatible with free will. So, yeah, I am going to analogize the neurological processes associated with deliberation with a train moving down a track, because even though there's a lot more complexity, it, the, the, according, if you have a deterministic view of the way the physical world works, you believe the outcome of the deliberations is as inevitable as it is with a computer program that might weigh a, a, a comparably complex uh, array of factors. And, right? and you know, the, the compatibilists like me should not try to change the subject or hide the, hide the truth. Of course, we're compatibilists about free will and determinism. Understanding what determinism means is tricky, um, but it definitely means that whether it's deterministic or has some quantum indeterminism in there, it means that every event, including how I deliberate, including how I choose, is ultimately caused by a big set of prior causes. Right. Ultimately going back to the Big Bang. But so, you don't want to say inevitably caused. You don't like the word inevitable. I mean, I just think inevitable has a meaning. The meaning yeah. is certain things are going to happen no matter what. And that's not what determinism means. Well, determinism yeah, again, yeah, I mean, they're not going to happen, happen given what happened in the past. Right. They're going to happen given what was ha- going to happen in, in, the, in the past. But it, it just seems to me that when the compatibilist says, well, if it hadn't been for your complex... Uh, the neuro, you know, neurologically grounded deliberations, um, you wouldn't have done what you did. That seems to me very much like saying if that train hadn't passed from B to C, it wouldn't have gotten to D, even though arrival at D in the real world was inevitable once it left A with a certain velocity. I mean, th- that, that I don't understand what the difference is, even though I recognize that the situation is a lot more complex, it just seems to me that if you're assuming determinism, which this whole yep. conversation is assuming, um, the, it seems to me that, that, that when, you know, well, I guess I've said it. But it just, let, me, let me try it this way, Bob. It's not different in kind. So for sure, it's not different in kind. Everything is part of the, the causal flow, if you want to put it that way. It sounds right. a little foolish. Um, but there are differences in what I call causal sourcehood. And I don't mean sourcehood in some magical sense of being a new cause in the universe, but just like scientists regularly pick out more and less important causes among genes, among circumstance, you know, circumstances, if you're doing a psychology experiment, among structural interactions, if you're an engineer, you pick out causal sources of later events. And what we're doing when we do that in the non-free will world, right, when we're just doing science or ordinary explanation, is we're picking out the causal factors that bring together a whole bunch of other causal factors. So they kind of are a funnel for a ton of causal factors. And then what they do, what happens at that causal funnel makes the crucial difference to the later event. And that, again, it doesn't get you any difference in kind, but what it gets you is the ability to say the human brain is a causal funnel for more information than as far as we know anything else in the universe is a causal funnel for. It is, it is a unique what, causal funnel. Right. And we what are it unique does, causal funnels. And, and if, if I can't wake up every morning saying I have free will, I guess I'll settle for waking up every morning saying I'm one hell of a causal funnel. Well, but, but it's a causal funnel that gives you uniqueness. Nobody else has a brain like yours that gives you creativity because of that conscious imaginative capacity that gives you something like moral responsibility to the extent that you're able to understand if you're not damaged in some way, you're able to understand the moral significance of various alternatives that you might choose, mm-hmm. deliberate among them. And then if you make the wrong choice, we can, I think it still makes sense to say to you, you should have tried harder or you should have known better. 
Well, I think it makes sense to say it if it will affect my future behavior for the better. That brings us back to the four. We had that conversation. Yeah. Um, but it, it crops up quite nicely here because the point is it's proper, it, it's useful for forward looking purposes, but whether or not it's appropriate to say it to you depends on what you actually did in the past. So it's yeah. backwards looking. Yeah. Um, I mean, so let me I move this to a different, I guess I, I kind of understand the, the compatibilist argument. I <laughs> am not persuaded. I, I, I'm not sure I understand it well enough. I, I, I'm not persuaded. Uh, and I'm a little surprised that it's the majority view in, in uh, philosophy, but apparently it is, right? Yeah, and again, just, I mean, for several reasons. One is because compatibilists also do a lot of work trying to shoot down incompatibilist arguments. So, you know, incompatibilists need to give an argument for the view that determinism rules out free will, and they do. Typically goes through either you don't have the ability to do otherwise, or you're not the ultimate source of your behavior. And then compatibilists try to respond to those arguments. And so most philosophers think those responses are sufficient. But as I said earlier, another reason is because to the extent people think an incompatibilist argument might work, they think it ultimately is going to make no difference whether you have agent causal powers or a soul or indeterminism or anything else, and then you're left with a dilemma. Either we have some sort of free will or free will is impossible. And that is sometimes enough to make people think, well, we should do the best we can giving an explanation for this phenomena rather than assuming that it can't be made sense of at all. So what were the first, what were those two common arguments? Um, so so against one, one is the one that goes through alternative possibilities. It says, if determinism is true, given the past and laws, everything is going to happen a certain way. Uh -huh. We can't do anything about the past. Right. We can't do anything about the laws. So we can't do anything about our current actions. It's, it's capturing your intuition that everything's inevitable in a sense. And if everything's inevitable in that sense, we can't do otherwise. And free will requires the ability to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. the, the most common response to that involves a very complicated thought experiment called Frankfurt cases. Do you want me to talk about them? Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to. It's not that complicated, it's, are they? Yeah, I, I don't think they're that complicated. All you have to do is imagine that brain technology I gave earlier where we can see what you're going to do and imagine the neuroscientists are looking at Bob trying to make a decision. You're trying to decide between uh, interviewing Eddie Namias or Dan Dennett for your podcast and you're thinking about stuff. And I'm the neuroscientist and I really want you to pick Eddie Namias. So I'm looking at your brain and if your brain shoots any neurons that I know would lead you to pick Dan Dennett, then I'm going to interfere and make sure those neurons don't fire. So you're going to pick Eddie Namias. Turns out your brain doesn't shoot any of those neurons. You pick Eddie Namias all on your own. So if you buy the thought experiment... Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean on your own? I mean, does the person intervene and stop? I don't it? intervene because I don't have to. Right, I don't have to because I'm looking. If I see, I see you if I see not anything, to intervene, I don't intervene because I don't have to. Okay, because I see that there's no there's no shoot of activity that's going to lead you away from picking me. Okay. If I had seen that, I would have intervened. Don't intervene. I do what you wanted me to do, and what's the conclusion? The conclusion is you couldn't do otherwise. Because if you would, if you would. Hey, that's my line. I'm the one. I mean, of course I couldn't do otherwise. I live in a deterministic universe. Okay. Uh, but, but the, but the intuition is supposed to be most people have the intuition. You chose me of your own free will. You're responsible for it. The fact, the fact that you couldn't have shown up, cho chosen Dennett because I would have intervened makes no difference to your free will. So the argument. It's tricky because if you already think determinism is a problem and that's the only way you're. So imagine it's not deterministic. Imagine 
you know. Let me say, by the way, that I think there's an analogy here between let's make a deal where Monty Hall knows what door the thing is behind. Yeah. And he chooses which one to open, but never mind. I, I don't want to go <laughs> any deeper. But I, I don't under I kind of don't understand the point of the thought experiment. I mean I mean, first of all, we're imagining uh this kind of well, you could imagine him as the this the experimenter being either kind of a godlike being or just a person in the causal universe. I guess the thought experiment wants me to think of the person who could intervene as himself being in the causal universe. It doesn't matter. Make it God. Okay, let's make it God. So God wants me to choose you and God sees, oh, I don't need to interview. He's leaning toward Eddie anyway. That's right. What do we conclude from that? We conclude that if people have the intuition that you chose me of your own free will. Yeah. And if they think you couldn't have done otherwise because God would have intervened, so you couldn't do otherwise, the conclusion is the ability to do otherwise is not important for free will. So wait, I <laughs> the, the truth is, I'm confused. I'm sorry. The the, the <laughs> <laughs> a, I told you it was a little tricky, but is, say that one more time, and then I'll give give up. So, okay. so the the compatibilist wants to say what about the import of that thought experiment? The compatibilist wants to say you can have free will even if you can't do otherwise. Why do they want to say that? Because we're talking about an incompatibilist argument that says determinism rules out the ability to do otherwise, and free will requires the ability to do otherwise. So. We're trying to we're trying to combat that by saying, here's a scenario where intuitively you acted of your own free will. Nobody mm. intervened on you, but you couldn't do otherwise. You could not do otherwise. But wait, what the incompatibilist says is, you're right, I couldn't do otherwise, and I didn't have free will. That's the way the incompatibilist views that. I understand, but you're the one that brought up thought experiments and people. Well, I know, but I, I don't. I don't see. I don't see how most ways against most people. Most ordinary people think you have free will in this scenario. Okay, though- but that's just a comment on the way ordinary people think about things. I don't understand how logically that demonstrates compatibilism. It doesn't. It just puts pressure on a crucial premise in this ar- incompatibilist argument that free will requires the ability to, to do otherwise. The, the compatibilist responds and says, why? Why does it require the ability to do otherwise? At which point, what do you say? It's intuitive. It seems that way. No, no, no. You know what I say? It's the way we have traditionally defined free will. Um, and uh, it's the way, to some of us at least, it's the definition of free will that would be meaningful in the way we've thought of as being as free will being meaningful. And you're saying there are people out there who don't agree on that point, but my, but I, I just traditionally it was just definitely definitionally true. I mean, that's the thing is, yeah, but, it, it's but like, definitionally, Earth was definitionally it was traditionally true that. The Earth was a was a stable body at the center of the universe. Once but that's we, an empirical question. That's an empirical well, question. The, the compatibilist argument is not an empirical argument. Well, I understand that, but it's but it does seem to be a question of whether or not the term free will has a certain meaning or not. You no well, one. Well, but see, this is this is exactly my my objection to compatibilism. Yeah is I think what they're doing is just redefining the terms. Well, who gets to decide what the term means, Bob? Well, but historically, free will and determinism had meanings that were incompatible the way they were conventionally conceived. And, and so if you want to say... Well, well I, don't, I don't want to redefine terms. Uh, I, want, I want to use the term free will the way it is connected with the way ordinary people understand it and the way it's traditionally been used. I don't think that the ability to do otherwise is a simple thing to understand. I think determinism is compatible with the ability to do otherwise, but that's only because but I didn't, understand didn't we, the... Didn't we, we have said that according to determinism, ever since the Big Bang, everything has been inevitable, right? No. We did not, because I told you I don't want to use the word inevitable. 
Uh, well, what did you say would be true if, what is the belief you were, you were uh, describing? Determinism is the view that holding fixed the actual past and the actual laws, the actual future is going to be a particular way. Okay. So, so let's so describe it that way. So let me, so let me ask you a question. Uh, as well, a can no, I ask you, what's the difference between that and inevitable? You know, I had this conversation with Dan Dennett and he got off into this thing about inevitable. Well, what does inevitable mean? And I'm like, yeah. what? We all know what people mean by inevitable. Why are we doing this? And I, so, and I'm having the same reaction. I was like, what is the difference between what you just said and what we mean by inevitable? Well, two things. And, and let me see if this helps at all. And, and I do think you have very strong incompatibilist intuitions. So you're not going to. I, you're right about that. Right. So two things. One, the point I made earlier that inevitable actually has connotations that I think are misleading if you think determinism entails it. The misleading okay. part is that certain things are going to happen no matter what. Okay. Point two, because that's not what determinism means. Okay, but, but why doesn't it? See it. So, so let, me, let me try this on you. Imagine that a lightning strike hits a particular tree at a particular yeah. time. Okay? You're a scientist. As a scientist, would you say it was inevitable that that lightning bolt hit that tree? Given the prior uh, array of circum the prior, prior situation and the laws of nature, yes. Okay. You added the given part, but now I'm, I'm asking you, was it inevitable that the lightning bolt hit that tree? Right. But, but I would say if you're a true determinist, and I'm not saying I am, if it's a strictly deterministic universe, even excluding quantum indeterminacy, if it's a strictly deterministic universe, what I would say is, it was inevitable given the prior circumstances and those Good. circumstances were inevitable given the prior circumstances and Good. so on. And ultimately I would say, yes, since the big bang, it's been inevitable. Right. That, but, that lightning would strike. Yes. But notice, notice that it was helpful that the example got you to cash out how much you were building into the lightning bolt being inevitable. What you would actually say if you were talking to someone or doing a scientific experiment and a lightning bolt hit a tree is you would say, well, that wasn't inevitable. Let me explain why it happened. And then if I said, but could it have hit this other tree? You would have said, yeah. And here's what would have happened. Here's what would have had to happen for it to hit this other tree. And you would have started doing this backwards thinking in the way scientists do when they think about causation. Why did this happen? Because of this. Could it have happened otherwise? Yes, but only if this. And that's right, what I mean but, by but, but, being inevitable. It, anything that is contingent is contingent precisely because if earlier things had been different, it would have been different. Sure, that's the flip side of determinism, that if earlier things had been different, things would have been different, but they weren't. They in weren't. The in, world, in the real world, it's never the case that they were other than what they were. Right, but they could have been. Well, given the circumstances where, immediately before them, no, they couldn't have in a deterministic. I understand. Case. I understand if you if you force us to think all the way back to the Big Bang, but nobody thinks that way about anything in the real world. Well, okay, but we're you're a philosopher. Your job is to think in a superhuman way. <laughs> That's right. And so, what we do when philosophers think about possibility is we think about possible worlds, and we think about. What is the best way to understand the claim that the lightning bolt could have hit this other tree, even if determinism is true? It's to think about a nearby possible world where something would have been slightly different. Maybe going back to the Big Bang. Unless indeterminism is true, in which case it's a nearby possible world where the quantum events went slightly different. So we can get very sophisticated philosophers when we talk about what's called modality or possibility. But that sophistication is one that allows us to talk about possibility. If we couldn't talk about possibility, we'd be screwed. We have to talk about possibility. So determinism you can can't make factual analysis. Yep, that's exactly what we would do. Right. You can yep. do it. Um, and, and generally, when we do it in the real world, we, we, the hinge point is some decision somebody made. What if George Bush hadn't decided to invade Iraq?
when we're thinking about humans, but when we think about natural phenomena, we think about hinge points too. They're those causal sure. tunnels that sure. I'm talking about. What if this gene hadn't been flipped on in this plant? What if this uh, brick hadn't been loose in this dam? The flood wouldn't have happened. Let me, let if, me actually give it, speaking yeah. of genes, speaking of genes, um, uh, how would you answer this question? I mean, I think we've maybe gone as far along that particular path as, as, as as we can but um what about this uh you know if there's, there's some criminal uh sitting in jail somewhere who's like let's say roughly your age doesn't matter if what what do you say if i say if you had been born with exactly his genes into exactly his environment and environment is defined comprehensively the the the, the chemicals uh, surrounding him in the womb all molecules ever impinging on him and all the information coming in would you be in that jail if you had yeah. been born with his genes in his environment yeah but that's only because i would be him exactly right so um, so, so that doesn't that so doesn't there's help no chance at his birth that he would not wind up in that jail uh depends what you mean by chance but holding fixed everything about his upbringing and background including the way he exercised all of his abilities that he had through his life, yes, he wouldn't have avoided that. Holding fixed all of that. Well, right, but again, I, we needn't belabor this. If we're assuming determinism, which again, I'm not, but if we are, um, all of those things you're holding fixed follow from prior causes and follow from prior causes until you get back and you look at the whole thing and say, yeah, it was inevitable. I mean... Right. Or, or you could say, let's look at his life. Let's look at the psychological capacities he had during his life. And let's think about whether he had the opportunities to exercise those capacities in other ways. Did he or did he not? And that, at that point, you have to try to figure out what it means to be able to have an opportunity or to have a capacity. And if you're stuck in the incompatibilist framework, you're going to think nobody ever has an opportunity to do anything that they didn't do. And the answer is, yes, they did. In the same way that the dam had an opportunity not to break if things had been done slightly different. Or the animal had an opportunity, the, the dog had an opportunity to catch the frisbee it dropped. But if determinism is true, it couldn't have caught that frisbee. Yeah, it could. It had the capacities. Nothing prevented it from doing it. It just didn't exercise the capacities in that in the right way. Similarly, this criminal, assuming he had all the right capacities, might have had the relevant opportunities to avoid making some of the choices he made. Okay. I guess I'll just I'll just summarize <laughs> my view one more time, and then you can say whatever you want. And then, and then if you have time, we can move on to talking about uh, something else. Really? Um, the uh, so it seems to me that the, that the compatibilist view is uh, in a causal sequence of A through Z, it's like Z is the present, A is the past. Yeah. You say, yes, Z was definitely going to happen given Y. Uh, y was definitely going to happen given X. These are like moments in time, circumstances yeah. at different moments in time, and so on all the way to A, but you don't want me to say Z was definitely going to happen given A, even though every step in the way, and I know you don't want me to use the word inevitable. I'm trying not to, but, but, um, but, but you don't even want me to say Z was definitely going to happen given A. No, you can say that. I can say that. Sure. So I can say that uh, notwithstanding my deliberations at 5 PM today, what I did at 6 PM was definitely going to happen given that my situation at 4 PM. Uh, I, I lost you on the notwithstanding your deliberations. Well, my, my um, uh, well, notwithstanding my sense that at 5 p.m. I was making, doing meaningful deliberation, the fact is that... No, you were doing meaningful deliberation. Okay, but, but anyway, uh, <laughs> you would still say that given my circumstances at 4 p.m., what I did at 6 p.m., in other words, what I think of as the outcome of the deliberations at 5 p.m., even at 4 p.m., what I did at 6 p.m. was definitely going to happen. 
it gets a little trickier the way you use the modal language there. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be a clever philosopher. I just want to point out that the, what you did at 6 p.m. depended on what happened at 4 p.m. It also sure. depended on what happened at 5 p.m. Um, but what happened at 4 p.m. was not, I don't want to, I don't want to say that anything specific that happened at 4 p.m. was the causal source of what you did at 6 p.m. Because it was the whole light cone of prior events that right. went through right. you. Again. So then, we're, you know, we, we've been repeating kind of the same point over and over that if you think free will somehow requires the ability to make the universe go different than it was going to go given the prior causes, then you don't have free will in a deterministic universe. Okay. If you think free will involves what you do at 6 p.m. depending crucially on the way your conscious deliberations go at 5 p.m. And there's nothing inevitable about 6 p.m. in the sense of it's going to happen no matter what you do at 5 p.m., then I think you have the type of free will that compatibilists are talking about. That was a very confusing final sentence, but hopefully... Well, I'll take your word for it. Well, in any event, we should say that if you held a vote among philosophers, apparently you would win and I would lose, so... If you held a vote among ordinary people, I think you'd win, too. You think you would win? You yeah. Would, yeah. But, I mean... Yeah, I, well, I'm trying to... I'm trying to, I, I, I'm trying to think who I, who, whose op opinion I attach more significance to, ordinary people or philosophers. In this case, apparently it doesn't matter. They agree that I'm wrong, so... Uh, I will just about, uh, about two thirds. There's still about a third. I think there's about a third of philosophers and about a third of people who have strong incompatibilist intuition. And, and are the third who are not compatibilist by and large determinists? It's about half and half. Really? Yeah. So I need to. So my next stop should be talking to someone who believes in free will and is not a compatibilist. Who, yeah. Who, is, who are who are the names there? Uh, so Bob Kane is one. Oh yeah. Um, he and tries also to do done, no, he connects it to physics, doesn't he? Yeah, he does it with quantum physics, and it probably won't satisfy you one bit because, ah. he, well, I mean, it won't satisfy you in the sense that he still thinks everything is causally uh, is causally brought about by earlier causes. Oh, I see. In the brain, there's going to be some indeterminism sometimes when we're making tough choices. The who 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 has the definition that you think is the correct and traditional definition are the agent causal theorists, the people who think we are agents in such a way that we can make a causal impact on the world that is not caused by prior causes. And those people include Tim O'Connor, um, a guy named Randy Clark at Florida State, uh, Helen Stewart, although she's got kind of a, a, an interesting view that says even animals have these agent causal powers. Um, so any of those would be a good person okay. to talk to. Uh, it's the reason that some compatibilists at least find their views uh, less attractive is because we think it's very hard to pull off those views while holding a naturalistic worldview. It looks yeah, like you have to, it looks like you're going to have to bring in a type of causal power that doesn't look like what we see in the rest of the natural world. I can see that it would be a challenge. You know, relatedly, let me ask you about this, the status of materialism or physicalism. I mean, this is the idea that, uh, well, I guess it's traditionally, I mean, I don't know, the kind of the high school, my high school student conception of materialism is very much related to determinism. It's that, well, look, all the stuff in the world is this physical stuff. It complies with scientific laws and, you know, you can kind of reach out and touch it. Um, the, the, uh, I'm, what is the, I mean, first of all, of course, that's not the definition that would prevail in philosophy, but what is, what, how would you describe what is the definition of physicalism and what its status is? Okay. So there's a lot of different definitions of it. Um, but the one that I think is sort of most plausible as the one we should accept is one that says everything that exists, including consciousness, including human cells, whatever, 
uh, is constituted of, that is, it's made up of things that are ultimately uh, what physics is going to tell us is the basis of the universe. So quarks or strings or whatever. So everything's made up of those things. But that's consistent with thinking that at higher levels of organization, you get real new entities like living organisms or genes or water or brains or right. maybe conscious minds. Um, and then secondly, I think it has to buy into some notion of there being some sort of law-like relations that govern these entities such that nothing can break the laws. But notice that that's pretty metaphysically neutral. Um, it may be, it may end up being a very reductionistic view in which, you know, everything at the higher level is identical to something at the lower level mm -hmm. so that we can even rule out the higher level stuff. It may be, it may even eliminate some of the higher level stuff and say consciousness doesn't really exist because only physical stuff exists. Or it could be a view that I think is more plausible, which allows for higher level phenomena to, to be considered real and to be considered having real causal import because the, Im the, the causal import is at that level such that no matter what individual quarks or strings make it up, it's the higher level entity that makes a causal difference to what happens next, not the particular quarks that make it up. Okay. Um, and does, I that think, make, does that make a little sense? Yeah, I would think, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I'd buy the distinction between the quarks making the difference and the entity making the difference. I mean, here we get into the question of whether there are emergent properties in the sense, kind of game-changing emergent properties as opposed to, I don't want him to be. Mis just I don't want him to be mysterious. I yeah. don't want him to be metaphysical. But I, but again, try and just pick something that you know most scientists think makes important causal differences, like genes, right? So this particular stretch of the genome, this of the chromosome, makes a crucial causal difference to how tall the plant will be. Well, was it the the four chemicals and their arrangement that made the difference or was it the quarks that could have been replaced? I mean, it wasn't none of the quarks that made up the A, B, G, C, T, whatever the letters are. Yeah. Um, none of them were crucial. What was crucial was that they had the particular chemical composition they had coming together. Well, I, I see good. what you mean. The, 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 uh, the parts some categories of parts are interchangeable. That's right. Um, and, so, and so it's the it's at the level where the organization is irreplaceable. Right. For the causal effect that we care about. And and just to briefly go back to what I care about, I think it's going to be turn out to be true that some of our conscious beliefs and desires are irreplaceable causally. They could be made up by various different neurons, but their organization is crucial to what happens later. Well, of course, one thing that's true of information generally is that it's, right. it's so-called substrate independent. I mean, it's, it's right. meaning and thus its practical impact on the world is, is often, certainly there are cases where, where it's independent of the physical stuff making it up. It's like, yep. if, I, if I hear that, my daughter needs me. What I do next doesn't matter whether I read it or saw it on TV. That's a perfect, that's a perfect analogy for this way of thinking about the higher level phenomena. But, right. information, but information isn't metaphysically mysterious. It's, it's composed of... Well, no, it's not, but... Some people think it is, but... Well, I mean, it's not in the sense that it's always physical stuff. But, 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 but at the same time, there is substrate independence... Which is there anything that's true of aside from information uh, where where the impact and meaning? Well, of course, meaning only applies to information. But yeah. uh, I, I mean, I, I do think something fundamental happens with substrate independence, and and maybe it's related to consciousness. I don't know. And now we're getting pretty weird. But let me yeah, getting back to consciousness. Yeah, I would think that this is one of the biggest challenges to physicalism. I mean, if you say consciousness is real. Mm -hmm. You know, I have subjective experience. It's real. It's like something to be me. And uh, it's like something to feel pain. And that is qualitatively different from 
the, the neurological processes that are correlated with the, plant, the pain. Feeling the pain is just different from the fact of the neurological processes. If you accept that, that consciousness, subjective experience is real, then it, it's kind of, I know there are philosophers who would say the consciousness itself like is physical, but many of us don't believe that, in which case you're talking about something that's real, that is not physical per se, even if it's dependent on physical processes for its existence. It is not physical. Are we, are we going to have the whole mind-body debate now, too? Well, uh, I, I, I'm just now, uh, yeah, well, I, we, have to, we have to go soon, but, 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 the, but I'm wondering, is that not taken as a challenge to physicalism these days? Oh, it, it definitely is. David Chalmers is, you know, world famous for coming up with arguments that suggest that consciousness is not, cannot be explained in terms of physical uh, information or physical truths or whatever. Um, I think those arguments fail, but it's kind but of... I'm not even yeah. saying that quite. I'm not saying, I'm saying assume that you're what's called an epiphenomenalist, so you believe that uh, my subjective experience is entirely kind of determined by physical processes and it has no effect on the physical process itself, fine, but it still is a real thing that is not itself physical. I don't think you can be an epiphenomenalist in the way you just described unless you're some type of dualist and you think that the consciousness is a different type of thing. So, Well, don't um, people think that? I mean, there are epiphenomenalists, oh, yeah, yeah. Right? People, right? Oh, yeah, people think that for sure. Notice how easy it is to have the bypassing intuition if you think that because then consciousness doesn't play a role. The reason, the reason I think that's the wrong view to take is because it would be a, a non-naturalist position, a non-physicalist position. It would be saying that consciousness, you can't, you can't have consciousness caused by the physical and not be separate from it. Two things, one thing that's a cause, one thing that's an effect are two things. So if consciousness really is separate from the physical, you're no longer a physicalist. So you're absolutely right that consciousness is mysterious and difficult to understand how we could, you know, get a physicalist explanation for it. But I think we certainly should hold out hope that we'll come up with a good theory that doesn't require anything like epiphenomenalism or dualism or something else that looks like it's saying consciousness can't be reconciled with the, the, the under, our understanding of the rest of the universe. So pretty much all epiphenomenalists would say they are not physicalists. Is that right? Because they are in some sense dualists? Some would uh, want to avoid saying that, but I think they're pretty much committed to it. And, um, oh, I was going to say something. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. It's like yeah. the, another qualitative difference, though. I mean, uh, you know, you said we can hope for a theory that something or other. But <laughs> a problem with, with, with the subjective experience per se yeah. is that it is not observable by anyone but me. And, of course, we know that in general things we hope to explain scientifically have to be observable by more than one person. The whole way science works is more than one person can observe the outcome of an experiment and they agree like this was the outcome. And so we're talking about explaining something that is not publicly observable, which just underscores the qualitative difference between consciousness and everything else science studies. Yeah, and that's the route that most of the arguments take, right? Whether it's zombies or inverted qualia or anything that says, look, here's all the physical information about Bob's brain but you don't know what it's like to be him. He could be seen green the way you see blue, or he could right. be a zombie who doesn't have any conscious experience at all. Um, and answering those arguments means you have to typically do something that might look as uh, shifty as the compatibilist look, right? You end up having to say something like, no, given what we know, if, Bob, if I knew everything about Bob's brain, I would know what it's like to be Bob. So that's one possibility. Or even if I wouldn't know what it's like for Bob to be Bob because my brain isn't in the same states as him, I know that Bob is definitely seeing green the way I see green, and he's definitely not a zombie. Mm -hmm. And I think once we have a theory of consciousness, 
that is explained in terms of the way the brain works, all those questions will look, all those philosophical thought experiments will start to look implausible in the same way that it looks implausible now to a physicist if you say, look, here's the way the matter is organized, but it doesn't have to have this energy. The physicist is going to say, that doesn't even make sense because now I understand Einstein. Uh -huh. We don't have our Einstein of consciousness yet. When we do, my suspicion will be the theory they give, though it may be difficult and maybe only you know, experts like physicists would understand it, but maybe not. It will get to the point where people will think, wait, you're telling me you've given me all this information out of the brain and then you want me to imagine that brain not having subjective experience? That doesn't even make sense. It'd be like you telling me, here's all the physical constituents of this kangaroo, but the kangaroo isn't a lot. That doesn't make sense now that we understand organic chemistry. Maybe I'm I'm skeptical that we'll ever have our Einstein of consciousness. But what is your what is your view on 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 consciousness? What what category are you in? I'm in the non-reductive physicalist view. So physicalist in the sense I described earlier, everything everything is constituted by physical things in accord with laws, uh, but non-reductive in the sense that consciousness. Again, not in any magically different way than genes or information, perhaps, has properties that cannot be best understood in terms of the entities that make it up, whether they be neurons or quarks or whatever level. So, I'm not sure I caught all that. Well, but what is the label again that you give yourself? Non reductive, because you're not reducing right. consciousness to the lower level physicalist because you're still saying ultimately everything is composed of physical stuff composed of yeah composed. what is, is dennett he's another type of non-reductive physicalist but probably more reductive than me <laughs> and are you like him in that if i accuse you of actually believing consciousness doesn't exist you'll get all mad yeah, because I think consciousness <laughs> definitely exists. So I'm, Maybe you I'm more sure. I'm more sure of my being conscious than I am of anything else. Just like old Descartes was. Uh, yeah, for all I know, you do believe it exists. But the more I talk to him, the more I become convinced that he doesn't. And <laughs> his getting mad only confirms that belief. But but the uh, and yet you would say consciousness is composed of physical things. Conscious properties are composed of physical things. Composed of. Because not just, not just uh, dependent on, caused by, uh, right. composed of. Well, dependent on as well, but that's consistent with composed of. Caused okay. by is the wrong way to talk about it because of the reason I had suggested that okay. then it looks like consciousness is separate. It's an effect of physical stuff. Okay. And, and what may be the final question, is there anything like a consensus in philosophy on this question? I mean, I mean, as much of a consensus as there is on compatibilism where you have like well more I, than 50%. I think it, I mean, there's a, there's an old poll that David Chalmers did where you can look this up, uh, and we can see. But if I remember correctly, it breaks down roughly the same way as the free will debate. About two thirds of philosophers are physicalists of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. and some more reductive than others, and about one-third aren't. And of the one-third that aren't, about a, half of them are skeptics, a limit of this, think consciousness doesn't really exist in the sense that, you know, people think it exists. And then about a third are dualists of some sort. Okay. But I'm making those numbers up. I think they're it's somewhere along that ballpark. It's 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 pretty messy though because all the people who call themselves physicalists are kind of all over the map. And most of the dualists are epiphenomenalists. Uh, either that or there's a there's a couple substance dualists left, but not a whole lot. Which means what? Cartesian. Yeah, they think it's a non-physical substance. Well, that doesn't seem totally crazy to me. But well, well, what do I know? But that doesn't mean I'm not. I could see an epiphenomenalist saying that too. But maybe I'm confusing it. Right. That's right. So epiphenomenalism, you can be either a substance dualist or what's called a property dualist, and you think they're non-physical properties. Right. Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> I've learned a lot, uh, and uh, 
but apparently my position on uh, compatibilism has been decisively overruled by a majority, not just of philosophers, but of ordinary citizens. Well, I don't, I mean, first of all, I don't think debates like these are solved by polls of either philosophers or the folk. Yeah. But what I think that information can tell us is why people think about these problems the way they do. Yeah. And they can help us diagnose each other's views. Yeah. And, you know, that's what I hope to have done a little bit today by at least giving other people, if not you, an understanding of why we shouldn't think that determinism or physicalism means bypassing. doesn't mean that we're not crucial causal. No, problems. no, I, I accept that. It doesn't no. mean bypassing the neurological no. processes uh, that are that are correlated with the deliberation, that are involved in the deliberation. I accept that. It's just not enough for you. And that's okay. <laughs> uh, I just think that, well, I uh, just train analogy. That's all I'll say. Train track <laughs> analogy. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for taking the time, Eddie. Where can people, we mentioned a couple of things that you've got the chapter in the book, uh, Neuroexistentialism. You've got the New York Times piece. Are there other things or other places? You've got uh, your they, website, I know. They can yeah, they can go to my website under research, and I've got, you know, my chapters, including stuff on the experimental philosophy on what ordinary people believe. Uh, the one about the brain scanning device is called It's Okay If My Brain Made Me Do It. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got uh, – some shorter pieces down below so people can look at any of that stuff. And then if I ever stop being chair of my department, maybe there'll be a book that explains all this someday. Well, that would be good. We, yeah. could, we, we could, we could use another book that, uh, that I disagree with. The world doesn't have enough of those. <laughs> um, so, uh, and are you on Twitter or anything? Uh, I'm on Facebook, but not very, philosophically not very philosophically no, i don't think i'm going to get on twitter these days given the way conversations seem to go down on twitter uh, it depends on who you follow yeah there is no one twitter there's just your twitter feed um but uh but you're right it can get kind of uh, it can get a little intense and ho hopefully i'll be back on very bad wizards one of these days like you were oh, oh have you been on very bad wizards we Long should time ago. we Tamar should plug we should yeah, plug that we God. should tell them. Tamler, Tamler and Dave are uh, real dicks. Nobody should listen to them ever. No, I'm just kidding. They're my friends. <laughs> Do you know them from way back? Yeah, yeah. They're great. Yeah, yeah. It's a podcast on, well, ostensibly on moral philosophy, but it's more far-ranging than that. Yep. Um, a psychologist and a philosopher. And, yeah, I recommend it. If, you, if, if you've decided not to listen to my podcast, that should be your second choice. Um, so anyway, uh, if nothing else, I know after this conversation that I can wake up in the morning saying that I am one hell of a causal funnel. Is that the term? Yeah, okay. you are. A unique causal funnel. I am a unique who's, causal. Who's created, who's created new books and podcasts that nobody else could Nobody have. else would have. That's right. A UCF. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. This was, this was a lot of fun, Eddie. Hope thanks, Mom. I hope your listeners get something out of it. I'm, I'm sure they will. All right. Take care.